you can start, Prof. Mankis. Okay, thanks, Valencia. Um, so welcome to everyone. Um, I'm Graham Mankis. I'm the second chair of medicine at the University of Cape Town. I'm an ID physician and uh, have been a member of the HIV Clinician Society for over 15 years now and involved in the guidelines development for over a decade. Um, and it's an extremely exciting uh, evening uh, that we're going to be listening to the, this evening, the, the webcast, um, because it's the launch of the digital version of the adult ART guidelines, which is really a, a landmark uh, in the evolution of the society's guidelines. Just to give you some background, uh, the adult ART guidelines were first uh, published by the society in the first edition of the journal uh, back in June 2000 uh, to coincide with uh, the famous uh, Durban AIDS conference. Uh, and that first journal I think was published by Des Martin. Um, the guidelines, the adult ART guidelines have been uh, updated every two or three years uh, by the society since that time. And really the purpose of those updates has been to align the guidelines with the latest evidence that's emerging internationally in the field of HIV therapy, uh, but also speak to the reality of treating HIV in a Southern African context, uh, dealing with issues around drug availability that were obviously far more acute in, in uh, preceding years, uh, and issues around cost of drugs that were again a far more uh, acute issue um, in, in the early years of antiretroviral therapy. Uh, but the guidelines have always provided an important resource uh, for clinicians working in both the public and the private sector in South Africa to inform the use of antiretroviral therapy and, and the monitoring thereof uh, in our local context. And they were first issued uh, within the journal in a printed format and then in later years um, in, in the uh, printed as well as an online PDF. And really when we sat down to plan the 2020 version of the guidelines, we realized that it was time for a renewal uh, and a new look to the guidelines. Uh, so the guidelines had expanded from initially just a few pages up to around about 35 pages. And we felt there was a need to break them down from, from one big uh, block of guidelines into, uh, the, 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 into modules. Um, that uh, could be up updated independently. So one feature of the current guidelines that were issued in 2020 is they're broken down into modules that we can, uh, in the years ahead, update a, a single or, or a few modules rather than having to update the whole guidelines. And that will allow us to keep them uh, more real time going forward. We also wanted to give them a more interactive feel with more tables and figures and infographics um, and also uh, move to a digital format and that's what we're going to hear about tonight and the overall intent was to provide a more user-friendly guideline uh, that would be used at the clinical interface and was would be more likely to be used at the clinical in interface by all clinicians uh, treating patients with HIV in South Africa. So that's what you're going to hear about tonight is the updated guidelines particularly the uh, new PDF interactive PDF and uh, the, the uh, online version um, and I just want one point that I want to uh, stress is, is that we're really looking forward to having the feedback of clinicians using these guidelines and suggestions for improvement. Um, I think that the intention is that this is not a finished product. Uh, we want feedback, we, want, we have the ability now to update regularly and hearing input from people about what, what works well, what doesn't work well and uh, what, what they would like to see in the in guidelines going forward, in terms, particularly in terms of interactive uh, components, uh, would be really useful. So before moving forward, I just want to acknowledge a, a few people to say thank you to RISIS, uh, who are the developers of the online content. Uh, uh, Karen Waterston, who was uh, designed the uh, PDF version of the guidelines, and you will see that that's a really remarkable document in terms of interactive uh, uh, feel to it compared to previous versions. Melissa Ramakers, who was the scientific copy editor, and Renata Tressel, who uh, undertook the marketing brand con concepts. Um, so to move on to the program for today, our first um, uh, sort of double header is going to be um, a talk on how to use the digital guidelines in the interactive PDF. And this is going to be given jointly by uh, Jeremy Nell um, and Jonathan Ball. I think uh, most people will know Jeremy um, 
physician and infectious diseases specialist at Helen Joseph Hospital uh, and, and uh, University of Bartosrand. Uh, Jeremy was chair of the guidelines com committee for 2020. And uh, Jonathan is the managing director of RISA software um, that was, as I said, responsible for digitalization of the guidelines and the society website. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Jeremy and then uh, Jeremy will hand over to Jonathan. Uh, just to say that uh, in terms of the format, we will have two sessions for uh, Q&A, uh, firstly after the input from Jeremy and Jonathan and then after the uh, input on digital platforms. Um, and we won't be uh, you know, taking uh, questions uh, from the floor in terms of opening it up to people to speak, but we encourage people to uh, type their questions either in the chat or in the Q&A box and, and we will uh, respond to those as many as we can in the time available. So over to you, Jeremy. Great, thanks very much, Graham, and um, and welcome to everyone uh, who's, who's uh, tuned in, so to speak, to this evening. And also to pay credit to Graham himself, who actually was the original impetus behind the redesign of these guidelines, who came up with the idea that really he wanted to take them to the next level in terms of accessibility and the modular, modularization uh, and availability on the digital platform as well. So this really stems from an idea that he had all this now many years ago, it feels like, but but this is a, this is the fruition of a number of really, you know, a, a number of years of work, um, but led by the HIV Clinician Society digitization team and, and Graham's already named many of them. And of course, also Lauren uh, as head of the HIV Clinician Society, who's put a lot of work in. So the first thing I want to give you is just an impression visually of what it looks like. Um, this sort of thing makes me very excited. This is incredibly uh, lovely looking document, which uh, is a huge upgrade on the previous versions in terms of the graphical uh, design and, and the layout. I'm going to expand the screen in a second just so that you can see the de in more detail. But I wanted to give you uh, the first impression as, as we whiz through the first couple of pages. Um, you can see that, uh, let me in fact at this point, uh, let me move this, uh, that's all in one. It's, Except that, sorry, uh, let us make this one page. There we are. So, uh, so what you can now see as you go through is really this is the third page of the guidelines. This is the table of contents. The first thing you may notice at the right at the top here is this what's new in the 2020 guidelines update. Then there's an a list of abbreviations. And then all the modules are listed thereafter. And we go down, I'm going to scroll down gently because I know this gives people a bit of whiplash when you scroll on your own screen. Um, all, all 29 of these modules uh, and then a references section at the end. Now each of these modules has its own little graphic icon but you'll notice as I've guided my cursor over each of these that these are all clickable. So let me go back to the top for example and I'll go slowly again. If you look for example and let's take a, an example here of the CD4 count you'll see that my cursor has now got uh, the icon to show that you can click on it which is one of the key things available here so I can click and then get taken to that part of the module. So here is an example of the module. This is module nine, the CD4 count that I clicked on. You can see how nicely the key points are brought up at the top with a, a key icon appropriately. Um, but this really highlights for each module, the key aspects that we think uh, as uh, Graham, myself and, and Sipo Clamini, who wrote uh, the majority of these guidelines together, that these are the key points that we wanted readers to take out of this. And we acknowledge that the guideline is, is a, a large document in whole, so we want this to be modularized and in chunks of information that you can get the level you need. So for example, if you just wanted the outlines of what to know about CD4 count, here it is as key points. Um, and then if you scroll down, you get more detail. And these are, this is the sort of detail that we've been used to in the previous guidelines. We did not compromise on the level of detail in the guidelines overall. So in other words, we, we, you know, we, we do understand that people use these guidelines for many reasons, some just to get a quick answer for a problem they have. Others, though, will want to learn from them or study from them sometimes, even if you're doing an exam, or want to get more detailed knowledge about HIV in general. And so we made sure that these, these guidelines have the level at which you're used to, at, but, but you can access them from several aspects. So for example, if you just want the key points, here it is. The text itself follows. You can see we've highlighted in the text, and this is a new thing from these, the latest 2020 guidelines, we've included common pitfalls in each of the modules. So 
here, for example, on CD4 count, it's got that the common pitfall is routinely checking CD4 counts, even if the previous result was more than 200 cells. And we say then underneath why that's wrong. I mean, you can see it's brought up nicely in red with a, uh, an icon, and this icon remains the same for every module. So in other words, if common pitfalls are always in red and they've always got the exclamation point. So again, if you're skimming through this, excuse me, and you want to know what sort of things to avoid, or at least we've drawn your attention to some of the common pitfalls. Um, another thing about the guidelines, as you can see here, is that we've introduced a lot more, uh, in fact, I'm gonna make this slightly smaller so we can see the whole thing, we've introduced a lot more tables and flow diagrams so that uh, the eye is guided that way and you can also see clinically what, uh, uh, sorry, quickly rather, what the uh, our appropriate guideline uh, guidance is on this particular topic. So there's lots of uh, 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 tables and, and flow diagrams um, which are now brought out you know, really nicely in the PDF form with um, the HIV Clinician Society colors. And then there's also, just from an aesthetic point of view, there's also uh, these, uh, these, the addition of a lot of these uh, clinical images appropriate to the particular chapter um, that really kind of give the guidelines uh, a much nicer look to it. A key thing here is at the bottom of every page, and you can see here where my cursor is at the bottom right, the bottom of every page, it's got back to table of contents. That is a clickable link again. So if you click there, you go right back to the top and you can see again where you want to come to next. So this guideline, the, the idea here is that you're able to move in and out on a PDF form that you could search it as well. So you can actually search uh, for these guidelines. If I uh, search for the topic, let's say liver, I could find certain things in it and it'll, it'll, it'll pick up the times when that's, um, that's, that phrase is used and we can go to it. Um, you can also see, like I said, that you are able to navigate in and out of the various sections um, as we go. A key other point at the end over here, so we've got references which we've put all the way at the end, which is nice because it doesn't clutter up the text and the individual modules. So it'll take you down here if you're interested in the references, you can see, and these are obviously references which are hyperlinked within the document itself. So if you find a particular reference, a bit in the text that re refers you to a reference, you'll be guided here, but you can get straight back to the table of contents by clicking back to the table of contents. And then one of the key other aspects to it is that the digitization team came up with a wonderful idea of including a separate section at the end here, 29, about useful algorithms and summaries. So really, if you click there, you get taken, and I'm gonna just zoom out just a little bit, not so, so that you can see the whole page, but uh, I, I, I'm aware this may be a bit small on your screen, but just so that you get the flavor of it. Now, what this has taken, what the team have done is they've really extracted the key guidelines uh, in terms of algorithms and in terms of tables, and they've put them all in one place at the end. So you can, you can actually know, for example, if you wanna know how to initiate antiretroviral therapy, this is the module, it's got how to diagnose it, here are the options, these are the baseline tests, do a TB screen, a cryptococcal meningitis symptom screen, and then either initiate or don't initiate. So you know it's all in one place. It is fairly nicely written in the module itself, but here's a good place at right at the end if you want the summary version of a lot of this. There's many other guidelines, as many other tables and things here, for example, are the adverse events and the dosing for each of the antiretrovirals. So they've been extracted from each of the individual modules and put together as a set of tables and flow diagrams. Um, and if I scroll down, apologies again here, for example, is the HIV drug-drug uh, interactions. And there's links that'll take you to the Liverpool HIV drug interaction checker if you want to click there, which is a particularly excellent one, as is the Cape Town uh, Medicine Information Center. But here, for example, if you click on the Liverpool one, you'll be taken to an online drug-drug um, in interaction checker, which you could use. Similarly, again, with certain other things, here's viral load monitoring, and then there's how to do viral load monitoring on dolutegravir-based regimens and so on and so on. So really what we've got in the last module there is a summary of most of the previous modules and really the key points in, in, in both flow diagram and in tabular form. Um, and then again, if once you're done with that and you wanna go back, you can click and you get straight back to the, the, uh, the, the table of contents page. There's also an abbreviation section, which we've put all the abbreviations at one point in because again, people may find that interesting if there's, if, or at least useful, if certain abbreviations are used in modules that they're unclear of, all the abbreviations used in the entire guideline are in one place here as well, if you ever do need to get back to it. And again, you can get to it easily through cl clicking on to, to go back to the contents page. There's also a lot of crosstalk between the modules. So for example, here's what's new in the guidelines. 
and they may take you, you can see that there's a link, for example, one of our key changes was about using dolutegravir as the preferred first line therapy. But here, if you click on module 11, well, not at this point, but if you click, usually it should take you then to module 11. And in fact, if you go through some of the other modules, uh, so for example here, oh, there we are. If you click, for example, at certain other places, it should take you to the individual modules um, that, that these are referenced. So you can get across modules easily if there's parts of the, the document that, um, that references other modules as well. And I think I'm probably uh, done at this point. What I'm gonna do is just quickly have a look and see, uh, was there anything else, uh, Karen? Oh, sorry, I'm currently saying click on the number of the modules uh, to link it. Oh, let's see. There we are. So if I click on the number, sorry, I was clicking on the wrong place. So if you click where it says module 20, if you click the number, it'll take you to that specific module. Um, I think that's it from me. So what I'm going to do is hand over now um, uh, uh, to Jonathan. And Jonathan, you're going to, one of the things, one of your duties is to explain to us how you get the PDF in the first place. And Jonathan, Jonathan is from RISIS and he's going to explain the other half of the night's uh, launch, which is the guidelines really on web on a web-based platform rather than as a PDF. So the PDF obviously could be downloaded to your phone or your computer at a moment's notice, but we have another way of showing the information, which we're also excited about. And I'm gonna hand to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Hi everybody and welcome. Um, so I'm gonna start off with, sorry, start off with sharing my screen. to can somebody confirm that they are seeing the guidelines yeah we can see your screen yeah okay great so um thanks jeremy as, as jeremy mentioned um you know the first thing uh, is to be able to find this uh, pdf to to download so on the on the sax website uh, under resources, it will be right at the top, the digitization guidelines for ARV therapy in adults. And this will take you to the ART guidelines. Um, and then you will see that the download PDF version is right at the top. So to download it, you just click on it and you can download it to your computer and, and use it locally. So I have a look there. This is exactly the same uh, PDF that Jeremy um, showed. Now, uh, so, so, the, so this digital version, as you can see, is, uh, you know, um, developed on, along the same design that uh, Karen Waterson did. We try to keep it as close as possible to, to the PDF, but with some web um, functionality. So the, the main page shows you how to use the guidelines to, to download the PDF and a, uh, a few various other um, uh, functions like signing up for updates and then the, the authors. And finally, um, right at the bottom here, you'll see that this is the link if you want to link it to anybody or, or save the link. So the first thing I'd like to show you is navigation. So similarly to um, what Jeremy showed you with the, with the table of contents, We've, we've put the table of contents on the right-hand side in the form of a scrollable um, uh, uh, bar. So you can quickly go to, to each of the modules. And this stays a, a visible uh, whenever you're scrolling, if you want to just quickly navigate to a particular module. So for example, I can click on this module and it'll take me to module four. And as you can see, the design is pretty much exactly the same as the PDF. Obviously, the content uh, where the key points are, are in a table followed by the content. And you can see the, the, common, the common pitfalls and, and, and the tables. We've also got hyperlinks so that if you click on a particular table, it will go directly to the, to, to the table. And then you can also navigate next module if you just want to carry on to the next module, uh, similarly how you would uh, a PDF. Then at any point in time, you can go back to the, to the main page um, and, and navigate from there. 
Then you've also got um, the key updates area, and this is editable by the society. So the society is able to uh, edit this page and also upload any attachments or documents relating to the guidelines. Then you've got the abbreviation section. So this opens up a, a tab and when you click on the, any abbreviation in the content, it'll open this up so that you can see the abbreviation immediately. Then um, I'd like to go through the, the search. So similarly to the PDF, we can search and it'll come up with all the various modules uh, that the keyword is relevant to. And you can just click on the, on the module and it'll take you there. It keeps the, the, the keyword highlighted so that you can quickly scan through if there's one, you know, one particular part of the, of the module that you're looking for. And then to clear it, you'll just clear, clear the search and the, the module will remain the same. Um, then we've got um, the additional tools, which is um, when you click on any of, the, of these additional tools, it will open up, you can save it, and then you can share it or print it. Just open up a, another one as an, an example. And there it is there. Um, what you can also do is write um, at the bottom as well, there are useful algorithms, the same as the PDF, and all of them this, are that on the PDF are available here. Then I'd like to show you the, the mobile version. So we've taken um, into account that you might be doing these guidelines on, on a phone. So this is just a demo of how the, how the mobile uh, version will work. The menu obviously uh, won't fit um, on the right hand side. So we have a, have a hover menu. So you can just find the particular module and go directly to the module. And as you can see, all the content is the same and um, you know, fit for, for a mobile. We do mention that some of the tables here that may look small, you just need to zoom in on your phone to, to see the, the content uh, properly. Right, and then, um, then there is a sign up for updates. So if anybody would like to receive any notification when there are updates to the guidelines, they simply need to fill in the form and click on submit. And whenever there are updates, uh, that person will be notified. You can also see the last updated date here. So if this, this date will change automatically when any of the um, any of the content is changed. And and then the key updates as well. So as the content changes, the, the key updates will, will highlight what has changed. And um, that is it uh, from, from my side. Um, and I'll hand over to Jeremy for any questions. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So just a couple of things from my side. So just to reinforce again, the sign up for updates, we really do want you guys to do that because that's going to be one of the mechanisms we use to push any new information. The, the, um, the idea behind this is that we could update individual modules, like Graham said, without updating the entire guideline so that these will be updated uh, in a, a sort of more peaceful meal fashion, but in a way that enables us to stay up to date and more relevant. So that signing up for updates is really helpful. And then just to highlight again that the additional tools where, where the Jonathan highlighted, those are available as A4 posters, as you can see there. So we've taken some of the key, um, th those parts in, in module 29 that you can see on the PDF. Um, and in on all of those kind of key tables and flow diagrams, etc., are available in this additional tool sections so that you could save them and print them out if you want. For example, some people might want it on the wall in the clinic or for example, or something like that where it's more, it's accessible and you don't have to download individual things. So that's, that's a, a, a key part of it as well. 
Um, and then, like like Jonathan said, these are obviously compatible on in terms of smartphones and tablets and computers. And then all that changes really is that that menu. Well, I think Jonathan, you can tell me if I've missed anything out. But the menu is the key thing that changes. On the big screens, it's always visible on the right, and on the small cell phones, there's a menu button that's visible, like Jonathan showed you. Um, but yeah, that should be it. Um, yeah, all right, great. Um, can I hand back to Graham maybe for, for let's take some Q&As. Okay. Thanks very much, Jeremy and Jonathan. Uh, yeah, just to start off to, to echo um, Jeremy's gratitude to Lauren Jack Lovitz, who has really uh, led this project uh, in terms of overseeing all of the multifaceted uh, aspects to bring this all together, both the, uh, you know, the updating of the guidelines on the part of the clinicians, uh, the development of the interactive PDF, and then the, the digital person, version. So you know, to, to, thank you to Lauren for holding it all together and, and leading the process. Um, so I, I see there's been a, a lot of positive feedback um, in, in the Q&A and the chat function. And um, you know, in response to that, I would just urge you to please share it with colleagues that are not on the call this evening, and make people aware of it. Um, and you know, share share the links on social media, say something about it, uh, because you know, a lot of hard work has gone into it, as, as Jeremy outlined, um, and and really the success will be measured by uh, the fact that it's used by clinicians uh, at the clinical interface, and that, that it's of use there. So. We really want to get the word out. Um, in terms of questions that have come in, I, I see Lauren has, has answered some of them um, in the um, in the Q and A function. Just uh, to to speak specifically to Le Secho and Tutang's um, uh, question, um, as Lauren says, we're not going to the kind of clinical details of the guidelines this evening. But I did want to make one point: is that we've always re referred. Uh, sort of viewed these guidelines as adult antiretroviral therapy guidelines as opposed to comprehensive HIV guidelines. So the main emphasis is on the use and monitoring of antiretroviral therapy. We do obviously make mention of prophylaxis um, and, and other aspects of care, but uh, they're not intended to be a, a comprehensive guideline with respect to the prevention and treatment of opportunistic infection. So we do uh, have, have a section on IPT, but it's not extensive. And, and I think people must just understand that the focus of these guidelines uh, is on antiretroviral therapy. Um, then there were, in, in the chat function, um, I just wanted to say, um, uh, so I think Zella Young's question about uh, getting to the menu, you, you've, Jeremy, you feel you've addressed that one? Um, uh, yeah, I'll I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the menu should be visible. It depends on the device, but it's either permanently on the right with the bigger screens or else it's a, it's a permanent bu uh, button that you can push for the smaller screens. Yeah, on some, on some smaller screens where, um, where the content will be cut off, uh, the, the menu will be at the top left uh, the same way as a mobile uh, device would be. So if you can't see it on the right-hand side, just have a look um, on the menu at, at the top and then the menu will be there. Okay, thanks. Um, and then uh, Delaney Sashuba asks, uh, do you need data to download, especially for rural communities with smartphones? So uh, maybe speak to the, the, the data requirements uh, for, for, for accessing it by the various uh, versions. Uh, just, uh, just to help a little bit with that, yes, you would need uh, access to data. Um, however, somebody can also email the PDF um, or, send, or, or you can also save the PDF on a memory stick and take it to a computer and, and copy it onto the device. Yeah, and, and I just add the, the entire, so if data is a problem, then probably the PDF is the best way, as you said, to download that and store it on your phone or store it on a computer or, or whatever. But the entire PDF is less than four megabytes in, in size. So it's really a very doable amount even for those with limited data access. It's, you know, we all share funny memes and it's probably about four or five pictures worth of, me of memes for the entire guideline. Yeah, thanks. Okay, and then um, Renata just makes the point that uh, the uh, link will be shared on all the SACS um, social media pages and also uh, obviously can be accessed via the website. Um, and then Lula, Lula Mela um, makes the point that uh, 
the guidelines have already been downloaded uh, and easy to reach and handy too. Um, so uh, Lauren says there's a question about how to print the guidelines. Um, yeah, so, so in order to print the guidelines, um, maybe let me just share my screen again. You could, uh, let me just go to a particular module. So what you can do is just right click anywhere and click on print and it'll come up with, uh, with the print dialog to, to print, print the particular module. However, if you want to, you could also print uh, using the PDF. Um, so you can just download the PDF and then you could print specific pages. But if you want to only print a specific module, you can just right click and click on print. But I think uh, what we might do is, uh, uh, you know, because of that question, uh, we will add a print button um, on every on every page, so that it's uh, easy for the users to to know where to print. Okay, um, so I, I see there are a few other points, uh, sort of advice points in the um, chat function, but I'm going to move over to uh, the uh, Q and A, um, and I think at the moment we're looking at. Um, sort of positive feedback, um, there's, there's not, I don't see, um, I see uh, Sela Masha Maete uh, says very impressive, accessible and uh, user-friendly. Uh, is there a forum to make further suggestions? Are there links to the websites uh, like the WHO? Jeremy, do you want to take that? Yeah, so thanks. In terms of the links, there are some links within the document to other other things, although not a lot, to be honest. Um, in terms of providing feedback, we certainly encourage that. Um, just trying to think, what's the what's the best way? Uh, is is there? There's no there's no feedback from the original page, I think. But if there isn't, we could add that. Um, Jonathan, do you have any any any, any insight? Um, yeah, that's that's a great uh, idea. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll add a feedback uh, link or button. Um, that will just open up your email um, clients with the address um, automatically, and then the feedback will be sent through to the society to consider. Thanks. Okay, that's so, awesome. so, Sela, if you, if you just look out for that, um, and uh, that we will be adding a, a feedback button, and, and uh, as I said earlier, we would really appreciate everybody's uh, thoughts uh, as to how it could be improved and, and what would make it uh, an even more useful resource at, at the clinical interface. Um, so Lesejo uh, says, I'm worried the society is moving faster than the government is the gu guideline with the government's blessing. You know, Lesejo, you know, as I said at the beginning, we've, we've um, the, the society has, um, you know, uh, put out guidelines for the last 21 years now. Um, and these have been intended to provide guidance to both the private and the public sector, um, often providing uh, some details that, that other guidelines don't, uh, you know, filling in the gaps. But when working in a public sector uh, setting, we would, you know, we've always made the point that the government guidelines uh, obviously take uh, precedence, that those are the ones that should be followed because those are the ones that uh, are govern the, um, the, the uh, clinical practice within a government setting. That being said, we've always tried to align our guidelines as much as we can with, with the government guidelines. So in general, these guidelines are aligned with, with the state guidelines, um, but uh, the, um, the, 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 um, the issue is that we obviously provide uh, some, some details that aren't uh, in, in the short, you know, in the, in the version that that currently is, exists of the DOH guidelines. I hope that answers your question. Um, but we, you know, we, we certainly don't want to, in, don't intend uh, to uh, create a situation where, where there's contradiction between the guidelines. Lauren, did you want to add anything? Sorry, Graham. No, I was just, um, just typing that you'd answered it live. Thanks. Okay, okay. No, sorry. I, th I, th I thought that you, you wanted to answer it. I misunderstood that. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So, so that, that that would be the important point to make is that the, these uh, these guidelines are intended to supplement um, the work and and to assist the work of doctors in the government uh, setting, not to. Um, uh, but the, the the state guidelines take precedence in that context in terms of the the the, the specific guidance with re regard to use and practice of antiretroviral therapy. Um, then uh, let me just see if there are other questions that um, have come in. Uh, so is it Isabel Ndora says, are there any plans to have these guidelines accessible via a dedicated WhatsApp support line uh, like the government did with COVID? Um, not not at, the, at the moment. I think, you know, our feeling was to have them available as a PDF um, and that um, the uh, the um, having having the interactive website was our current plan. Jeremy, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, no, no. Thanks. That's yeah, that's perfect. I think for now, for now, not uh, that's that's a whole other project. But uh, but again, if that would be valuable and enough people think about it, please leave that in the feedback, and you know we'll certainly consider it and, and pass it up the chain. Yeah, and. Uh, Siabonga Guala asked the question, is it not possible to put this in an app format? And I would say we had a lot of discussion about this. Um, Jeremy or Jonathan, do you want to speak to the decision to rather make it a, a PDF um, that could be accessed by um, cell phones rather than a, an app? Uh, yeah, I can I'll kick it off and then uh, Jonathan, you can feed, feed in anything else that you, you think I've missed. So as Graham said, we had a lot of debate about this as to whether to make it an app versus a, a searchable PDF. Um, and in the end, we went to the PDF. Just it's logistically much easier for a number of reasons. One is that there are multiple operating systems uh, that have to work for an app. And each time any of those operating systems change, it often breaks the apps, as we know from some of the other apps you download. And you have to have kind of a constant team of updates. The other thing as well is that it, it, the apps require constant data in many cases. I mean, some, sometimes you are able to download uh, the majority of the apps, but we've thought this way around, it's the best of both worlds. You get a, a PDF that you can say open on any, on any operating system on any phone. And then there's also a web-based platform, which if you prefer to do it that way, it functions very similarly to the app, you know, in the sense that this is, it, it looks like an, an app in many ways, but it's logistically much easier because uh, the, 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 the web-based platforms don't get updated in terms of the software or the parts uh, nearly as quickly as operating systems do. Um, Jonathan, do you want to add anything? Did I, did I cover it or were there, is there something you'd like to add? Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, you pretty much uh, covered everything. Um, and, and, and logistically, it is easier to, as Jeremy said, logistically, it is easier to get a web, um, um, uh, a, you know, a website, a web URL um, over to any device, uh, regardless of the operating system. And it just also helps with updates so that we don't need to deploy updates to apps. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, Jonathan, you know, from what, from what I recall in our discussions was, you know, and to answer Sia Bonga is that a well-designed PDF that is is designed for the format of a, of a cell phone is is as user-friendly as an app, um, but just has that benefit in terms of being more readily able to update. Um, so I, I, I see there was a suggestion from Brian Chisholm um, um, to say that we could mark the small differences uh, that they are to the public sector guidelines, and that's something that we could certainly consider, but again, to emphasize that the, you know, there's no major contradictions. And, and uh, Dorothy Williams asks, uh, does this also align with the PAC guidelines? And Jeremy, do you want, do you want to address that one? Uh, so I'm not sure actually <laughs> what, what are the PAC guidelines? Have I, have I missed something? So the, the primary care guidelines. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Oh, I beg your pardon. The knowledge translation unit, which really align with the government guidelines on antiretroviral therapy, I think, yeah. Jeremy, are you there? Yeah, sorry, yeah. So no, then, then they then they do. So they, as Graham says, they, it's largely aligned with, with the government guidelines. And then you know there are some some instances where it differs, but again, uh, those are not uh, core to the, the the purpose of the guidelines. In general, what we found with both Department of Health guidelines and, for example, WHO guidelines, etc., 
by comparison is that these HIV clinician society guidelines often go into the reason and the rationale a lot better and a lot more thoroughly. And so they're useful to read in a, you know, alongside, even if you are based, basing your, your, the majority of your care by the Department of Health guidelines, these guidelines still have quite a lot to offer in terms of uh, nuance and, and, and depth. And the kind of clinical challenges um, that, that deal with the complexity of individual patient management that often in an abbreviated public health guideline, you, you can't address. Um, the brevity is important, uh, obviously, for, a, for a, a public health sector, you know, public health approach to antiretroviral therapy, but clinicians still have to find that, face the challenges of individual patients. And that's what we've tried to encompass in these guidelines over the years. Um, okay, so thanks very much to both Jeremy and Jonathan for that. Uh, those inputs and then the, the, the discussion. We're going to move on to the next section. Um, and this is to really uh, give uh, the, uh, the attendees on the call some insight into other uh, digital health platforms that are, are really useful resources for practicing in a Southern African context. Um, and firstly, we're going to hear from uh, Will Maffin about the Vula mobile digital referral platform. And then after that, uh, from Siraj Adams about other digital health platforms. So just to int introduce uh, Will first, Will is a rural doctor uh, who uh, developed and led the development of, a Vula, of the Vula mobile app uh, when he uh, realized the, the problems that were happening in our health system uh, with referral to, uh, with, 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 um, relate in relation to referral communication between different components of the health sector. And then uh, Siraj uh, is, uh, is currently the South African Pharmacy Council Pharmacist of the Year, uh, and he's been a TEDx speaker. He obtained his B-Farm, MBA and MPH degrees, and he advocated for PrEP to be reimbursed by the private sector and has launched uh, HIV, TB and PrEP and HSS apps and platforms for the Department of Health. So we're going to hear from Will and then immediately followed by Siraj and that will be then uh, followed by a, a Q&A session uh, that will be uh, led by uh, Regina Osi. So over to you Will uh, to take the discussion forward. Thanks very much for, for participating this evening. Great, thanks very much. Um, so I'll share my screen. Um, so yeah, my name is Dr. Uh, William Mappham. Uh, my real passion is improving healthcare in uh, rural areas. And I guess to start off with a question, um, have you ever battled to get specialist advice or to make an appointment for a patient or to make a referral? Uh, because this is a problem I faced uh, myself. I'm from the Eastern Cape. I did all my electives in the Eastern Cape as a student and was determined to go back there to make a difference. Uh, so this was the road to my first job at uh, Madhuraleni Hospital. Uh, there were three of us working there at the time and we did our best um, and in fact you can it's grown substantially since then you can even specialize in family medicine there now uh, but at the time we were quite lonely and although we did a lot of good work there were also some huge challenges uh, this is a letter that i wrote myself in 2004 a patient had an eye condition and i didn't know uh, exactly what it was it looked serious uh, so i wrote this letter and i said please go to Tata. It's only three hours away and um, hopefully the eye clinic there can help you. Uh, seven years later, I went uh, back to volunteer and I was an ophthalmologist and the gentleman came with exactly the same letter. This is the letter he, that I'd written seven years before and he had gone blind in that eye. And then I realized that um, it was actually a relatively simple condition and we had the medication he needed the first time and um, I'd seen him, I just didn't know how to treat it as a junior doctor. Um, you know that many of our patients travel huge distances to get to um, specialist uh, centers. For example, in the Northern Cape to get to the nearest eye clinic uh, from Nababip, it's seven hours drive uh, to Kimberley. However, it was only when I was um, specializing, uh, this is me at Tigerberg Hospital, that I realized the problem wasn't just uh, in the rural areas. You can see I'm seeing one patient, I'm teaching students, the more patients are waiting, and that phone in the corner just rings off the hook with people like me in the past trying to get hold of a, a specialist opinion or an appointment. So our real vision was to make sure that everyone or all health workers quick access to, to specialist advice, that all patients can get the best possible healthcare in their area. 
Uh, Vrula is an app that's available on both uh, well, all app stores and it's free to download and use and it uses 20 times less data than WhatsApp. So absolutely minute amounts of um, uh, data. Our top user is an orthopedic surgeon at Livingston Hospital in the Eastern Cape. It costs them four rand uh, to use Vrula per month. Um, so it really is kind of cost effective. I thought I'd show you a quick, uh, just a quick demonstration exactly of how it, um, how it works. Um, so you should see my phone shortly. Uh, you'll see there's also an advert for free mental health um, counseling if you need it, if you're using Vrula. And for example, in the past, I would try and phone the doctor and call. I would try and get hold of the hospital, maybe through the switchboard. However, now, if you click on your referral, I'm going to choose Kruliskia because I know Graham is uh, working there. And here you can see all the departments that are on Vrula, exactly who's on call. I'll just go down to infectious diseases. You can see that Terry there's on call tonight. Um, I'm able to put the patient information in, and then we built our own chat system in to um, help you communicate with the doctor on call. So it's really, really simple and easy to use. And one example with the Clinician Society, you will see that that uh, number two ARV advice, um, that's specifically for pharmacists um, that have been using um, Vrula to contact experts on call. So that's just a very quick um, uh, demonstration. Happy to arrange more appointments with you uh, to uh, go through more of the details. I'll just also show you how uh, some of the other ways Vrula has been used. Um, so Vrula started in ophthalmology, which is my specialty. Um, it's now used by 83 types of health worker and you can accept referrals across 53 uh, different specialties. Um, it's been going for some time now, since 2014. Uh, so we've got a lot of scale and we've uh, learned a lot of lessons along the way. And there are almost 20,000 health workers uh, on Vrula currently. And currently, uh, Vrula is sent uh, every minute. Uh, it's quite widely used, uh, especially in the Western Cape, and we're growing into the other provinces as well. So wherever you are, hopefully we can help you uh, with your referral systems. Um, and if you want to think of what is the referral system really, it's, uh, we actually took a quote from the NHI document, and it's both the glue that holds the health system together, as well as the oil that helps it work uh, efficiently. Uh, there's also a web platform, so it's like a, um, a web portal. So if you don't have a cell phone, but you do have a data connection with a computer in your hospital, you're still able to use um, Vrula. And you're also able to use it to communicate with your patients. So rather than having to use your own personal WhatsApp or email or something that might get lost, you are now able to use uh, Vrula to communicate with your patients as well. Um, so yeah, like so, currently a lot of you are probably using Telegram, uh, WhatsApp, uh, various other messaging um, systems. Uh, but we really suggest that you start moving towards systems like Vrula, uh, which are much more clinically appropriate. Uh, we've done all the compliance work for you. Um, so that's very important, especially in the medical environment. And uh, it's also used not just for referrals in terms of actual patients, it's used for mentoring of uh, students for nursing, physio, clinical associate and medical students uh, for universities so far. So if you're at a university at the moment and you like to mentor your students, uh, this is something that Brula is used for. Uh, obviously, because all the information has come in, it's all collected, it's all stored securely, suddenly you're able to do analytics that might not have been possible before. For example, at Freer Hospital in the Eastern Cape, we showed that 80% of their referrals came from Butterworth Hospital. And we we're also able to show what types of referrals. So we showed that most of them were hand and foot injuries. So now they can send one surgeon there uh, once a week, rather than all the patients coming through to um, Freer. And we also have an engagement system, so you can actually put links into the app. Uh, currently, there's free COVID testing available, um, and there are some messages around COVID, and looking forward to promoting the HIV guidelines um, from this present from this uh, meeting on our platform too. Um, just to show you what happens in the sort of the longer term, uh, this is Sister Elizabeth Turnison. Uh, she's at Freedom Hospital. Uh, she ruled us for about two years, and then. Uh, she stopped sending us messages, and so we thought that it's maybe something had happened to her. Uh, but when we um, went to phone her, she said, no, she's fine. She just knows what to do now. So she had learned case by case enough to actually manage the eye patients in her area. She also used the data to motivate um, that there should be an eye clinic in Fredendal. This is the opening, a picture of the opening of the eye clinic in Fredendal. 
and uh, it's opened and now all the patients get treated there. And once a month, the surgeon goes to operate for her. So by using really good communication techniques and collecting data along the way, you really can create massive changes uh, and evidence-based changes in the health system. So thank you very much. Um, I think I can show um, perhaps a quick video. Um, uh, hopefully this will come through. Um, otherwise I can share this with you later. How to do it. This app definitely helps us identify which patients are just for conservative management so that they don't have to be transported unnecessarily. The patients that we do need to see, we happily accept them over the Vula app yeah, and we expedite their treatment. The future of Vula, it's pivotal in South Africa at the moment with where the link or the working between private and public is going to become much more um, intense. And for that reason, it, it puts specialists in contact across both settings. If you're just giving a clinical history, I think it definitely does have a place in the psychiatry. The app brought the whole specialist medical field to the rural area. And the patient now has access to specialist care, which they never had before. So what happens is that, uh, you, so you may find a nurse or a junior doctor that's, that's often without support in the periphery. And by being available and accessible, you're able to help them. And they, they don't feel alone or they don't feel unsupported. Uh, they're also protected by being on a database that is provincially approved. And you know it's getting to the right person at the right time. So where, at, you know, at consultant level, you might often phone you know your your colleague but the conversation will still end with you know just vula this to my registrar just vula this to to the to the mo again in the old days it was very difficult to get a hold of a psychiatrist because the emergency service was not so um adapt they they eight to five office kind of doctors um but now with Vula, what helps is you have someone that you can contact that, that you can say, this is the situation I'm dealing with. Can we get an urgent or emergent referral? And I think a lot of people have big gaps in their knowledge about psychiatry. And there's a lot of doctors, we don't often have time to go back to medical school notes, etc. So when you have a psychiatric patient in a periphery, you know you've got these gaps. You have a patient, you don't know what quite's going on, but you think there's something wrong. Now with this app, you can go and type everything down send it to somebody that has some in-depth knowledge and at the same time they can message you and you can then ask those questions that they need and they feel clinically relevant you know often someone tells you something over the phone and and you have that mental picture in your head and you're like okay i can relax this is not so serious or the other way around you know they say something you're like oh, how are we going to deal with this now and vula just provides you with that the actual picture the actual x-ray and and you can just much more sort of accurately make decisions. That is a big help. And I think with psychiatry, even though they don't need images and that type of stuff, it's just the pertinent questions that need to be asked. And then also they can even give advice what to start on while they're waiting for the next clinic, etc. Because those drugs we don't use often and a lot of people are scared because of some of the side effects. You can't motivate for something if you don't have the proof. So um, we learn the statistics, statistics we get from Vula will help us you know, improve our services, see where the need is and see what we can do to you know, plug the hole in the system. From a personal perspective, I, I love using Vula. Um, it makes my, my work easier. I can carry on with one patient while I'm referring another patient. And it's definitely something that I want to use even more. Great, so I hope that gives you um, a sense of uh, what Vula is and I'm uh, happy to share my details uh, on, this, um, on this channel and yeah, answer any questions in the future. Great, th thanks Will for a really informative presentation. We, we're gonna move straight over to Siraj. Hello. 
share screen. Thank you, Graham. So, good day, everybody. I'd like to talk to you about HIV disease uh, platforms in South Africa. Um, uh, the journey with the Clinician Society started a long time ago with myself and Lauren um, and the Clinician Society advocating for various preventative actions. Um, it was the major uh, initiative around promoting a, uh, circumcision, um, training of GPs in the private sector. Uh, you can see myself, Eric and Fra Francesca promoting access to PrEP, uh, to the private sector medical aids, and you know, in um, the initial launch of the HIV guideline, with you know Francois being key there with the minister, um, launching the, the 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 start of the Department of Health's journey towards um, digi uh, digital platforms as well. The Department of Health has also been proactive in adopting platforms as well. Um, in addition, they also besides HIV and TB, they also have HIV self screening and PrEP guidelines. And in terms of the HIV self-screening aspects within the South African context, there are various uh, screening um, kits that are available, namely oral and blood. Some are WHO approved, some are CE approved, some are available in the private sector, but uh, some are just mainly in the public sector. And screening, as you can understand, is a, is a major part of uh, knowing your status uh, with regards to the first 90. So the Clinician Society took it one step further and they wanted to uh, get involved with access to treatment um, at the primary care level through the private sector infrastructure. And Lauren um, and Francois got together and decided that they wanted to uh, create access to uh, first-line therapy, PEP, PrEP, and they, uh, they, they, they won the Innovation Grant Award with, with USAID were able to develop um, uh, a concept called PUMART. And, and together with Jackie uh, from the ICPA, uh, Will from Vula, uh, Digital Health, they created the EPIC Consortium to develop PUMART, Pharmacy Initiated AOT. And the EPIC program aimed to improve access to HIV screening treatment within South Africa's existing pharmacy infrastructure. This is the retail pharmacy infrastructure. Um, and what was achieved within 14 months has been remarkable. They developed uh, with the guidance of Graham and uh, the uh, experts such as uh, Eunice Musa, um, Catherine Odell, Jeremy Nall, et cetera, that all uh, uh, in Francois's team uh, was critical in developing these new guidelines for pharmacists to be able to, uh, and pharmacy-based nurses. Um, they also developed um, uh, quality training manuals. Uh, initially, it was face-to-face um, -face training, and then eventually it became online when COVID hit uh, in about March 2020, and uh, travel was uh, prohibited. And then we had to adapt towards everything being digital. So I think the Clinician Society uh, is extremely adaptable and responsive to the trends with regards to digitization. Um, in addition, they, they, they had to bring on all the pharmacy groups, this game clicks independent pharmacies. And it was a phenomenal achievement to be able to get them to all collaborate and work together on one single platform. They all got trained, had to qualify, of course had to be accredited by pharmacy council, and they all had to use a, a centralized disease management platform. And then together with the expertise uh, from Karen and Renata, uh, who developed the marketing collateral. As you can see, uh, Karen's hand has been involved in, in the development of the online curriculum as well. So the outcomes of this entire process was that currently there are 519 uh, active sites uh, in the private sector um, that can now uh, uh, initiate PEP, PrEP and First Line. And this was, uh, a, you know, like I said, at the end of the 14 months, this was a, a significant achievement. You can see the provincial distribution. So reach and access is available. And you can see the participation from the various groups uh, led by Clicks and Discam, and we and we feel very proud by the fact that the independent pharmacies in the in the in the in the in the lower income communities are also taking a lead in participating and reaching to uh, their, their various communities because 
it has to be a collaborative model. It couldn't have been, you know, uh, um, just one group. It had to be everybody. So if the patient was to travel between an independent pharmacy and clicks their health record, would travel with them. Um, as part of our process, we created a hashtag campaign. Again, the Clinician Society led this digitization of hashtags and social media uh, with Renata and Natalie sort of driving this entire marketing campaign. And you ended up uh, driving awareness of screening, as I mentioned before, where it all starts uh, and the role of HIV self screening. We actually incorporated HIV self screening as part of our uh, lead generator into the prescribing platform. And, and this allowed us to be able to guide people to where the nearest services are. So you had this geotag capability. And again, this was sort of quite quite uh, unique for patients to be able to find their healthcare resources uh, from their mobile devices. They were then able to, using um, one-time point passwords um, to ensure confidentiality, um, uh, access screening uh, uh, discreetly and confidentially. Um, once the patient has been um, uh, screened and they wanted to uh, move on to therapy uh, after a counseling session at, in, in, the, in the clinics, they were able to do that. And fortunately, because there was this integration between screening and the disease management process, if somebody's unique identifier, such as the ID, passport, uh, or work permit was used, we would be able to recognize when this patient was initially screened. So that screening and linkage to care path was closed. And I, and, and I think that is a, a significant milestone in any um, uh, screening and, and treatment program is linking screening uh, to therapy and being able to track when the patient screen and when they actually initiate on therapy. In terms of who, uh, who has been reached, uh, the vulnerable women under the age of 30, and I think that's a, that is something that um, has been identified as um, an important population to, to reach. And using a technology-based system, um, this has been also a significant achievement. The platform was also interoperable um, with uh, the various um, uh, platforms within the Department of Health. And ultimately, you created a centralized national patient management system, which allows patients the freedom to move between clicks, disc, and independent pharmacies. It also, due to the uh, Clinician Society's uh, um, support of uh, making available expert doctors for telemedicine support services. It is also the largest HIV tele telemedicine platform in South Africa. Um, it also allows, it also has an in, uh, embedded an e-prescription platform for Pomart accredited pharmacy staff to be able to generate uh, digital prescriptions. So I'd like to stop, to stop and share and then move over to actually show you uh, the platforms in a live environment. So um, the first one is obviously to promote the course. So the Clinician Society has various courses. PubMod obviously is the one that, that I'm showing you here where people can log. Um, uh, well, this was how people got onto the, onto the platform. They had, they had um, MCQs, online videos, OSCEs, they had to pass an exam of 80%. And it was a major achievement to be able to take this customized guideline from Francois and Graham's mind and Jeremy's mind and, and actually be able to, to teach it um, na you know, nationally at the same time. Um, and it was a huge success. I mean, we set, we set the bar high and people managed to do it. So I just need to come down. Oh, that's right. Next. Um, so one of the other achievements from the Clinician Society was that they managed to get Tomat uh, approved by Pharmacy Council, and subsequently it has recently been gazetted. So I think that's also another major achievement that we there's been this legislative regulatory uh, uh, adoption and change, which has made it more accessible as well, um, and and, le and 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 legislated uh, into into healthcare these days. So I think that's also something that um, people don't understand is that it took a concept to a course 
took it, he killed it, got it approved, got it accredited, then got it gazetted as well. So it's in, you know, in terms of, you know, the way healthcare is now managed uh, has been fundamentally changed because now people are able to access PEP, PrEP and first line more conveniently. So I just like to also take us through the little bit of a journey around where uh, things are. So as you know, the Department of Health also has updated guidelines and um, these are um, slightly different to the clinician society guidelines, but the, uh, in terms of the uh, PDF capability. So obviously the latest version from the clinician society is PDF uh, is a lot more responsive design. So it works quite nicely on a, on a mobile phone. And that allows us to be able to uh, use it basically on your, on your phone. In terms of other HIV platforms, there's the HIV self-testing platform where people can order and get uh, kits delivered. In terms of HIV self-testing, there's the support platform called by Avada called the Itaka platform that allows you to be able to link to care as well uh, within the state sector. So um, the, this is also a, a, a quite a quite a useful platform for people that want to be able to know what to do within the within the public sector resources. Another H, uh, digital platform that has uh, HIV uh, content is the EM guidance by Yasin and Mohammed. So they've obviously also uh, uh, been able to incorporate guidelines within their um, uh, clinical resource tool to be able to you know that that covers all types of uh, conditions. Um, and that's also quite a useful pocket guide uh, resource. Then in terms of the practical service, you're looking at the PrEP Club where it's the largest online PrEP delivery platform uh, as well. And then finally, you're looking at um, uh, PMOT. So I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the, the main services within, within the platform. So the main one is the prescription pad, which allows um, permitted pharmacists to be able to uh, prescribe uh, therapy. Um, then there's the telemedicine service that allows the um, healthcare worker sitting with the patient to be able to have an expert consult with one of the HIV Clinician Society's uh, doctors. Um, there's the pathology um, request component um, where you can uh, select tests as well as pathology capture components where you can capture it and then we've got the treatment plan which allows you to be able to you know forecast when the next appointments are uh, so the patient is is able to know what to do this thing links to the HIV clinics but app as well where the patient's receiving reminders so I just like to show you some of the HIV platforms that that exist um, and so from an HIV niche perspective, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, useful tools, both for public sector and for private sector uh, healthcare providers. Uh, I'd like to end there, if there are any questions. Thank you so much, um, Siraj, for your presentation. Um, this is Regina also speaking. I'll um, moderate some of the question and answers and also thank you, Will, for the very nice presentation on the Vula app. Um, there aren't a lot of questions. I think a lot of questions have been answered, uh, but perhaps um, the last, the one that still is outstanding for the Vula app is a question from Francois, where he's asking if you can comment on the litigation benefits, um, the fact that it is super protected on a good record with data stamps and so on. Is that something that um, is beneficial? in terms of potential litigation around referrals. And I think that question is for Will um, for the Vula uh, app. Yes, thanks. And thanks for the question. Um, it's, I mean, lit medical litigation is increasing, um, as I'm sure you know. Um, I do have a bit of insight because my uncle is actually a medical malpractice lawyer. So I also get the heads up from his side on when uh, they want to start preying on new cases. Um, but basically what Vula does is it makes sure that your communication is both saved and stored securely. And as for example, it's also done in a, in a manner that is not actually stored on your phone as such. So for example, if you take a photograph of a patient that's stored in your gallery, if you take a patient through Vula, it's not stored in your gallery. So your child will not scroll through and see uh, pictures of your, of your patients. And that's very, uh, very important, especially with the new puppy um, legislation coming into act. 
uh, very, very soon. Uh, so there have been a few cases where Vula has been used in courts of law, and in all of those cases, the, course, the case has been settled out of court uh, because it was exactly obvious what actually happened. The best thing you can do for a lawyer is to have communication that doesn't exist. Uh, you haven't saved it or it's been deleted or lost, uh, because then the lawyers will argue on a he said, she said basis, and um, that tends to get very expensive very, very quickly. Uh, so we strongly suggest that you move towards secure platforms uh, like, like using Vula. Other nice thing is it holds people accountable. So if you make a referral, there's another question about, you know, what happens if someone makes a referral on a piece of paper and the patient doesn't come back? And the point with Vula is that um, everything is date stamped. You can see exactly the time it took for that specialist to respond. And we report on those findings every month to the departments using Vula. So the average response time is between 10 and 15 minutes, uh, depending on the department. Um, but that means basically you're getting a specialist opinion you know, very, very quickly. And uh, yeah, it helps, helps, holds everyone accountable at the end of the day. Um, it's very hard to hold someone accountable with a piece of paper these days. Uh, you need that digital record. Thanks. Um, there is also another question out from um, Stephanie Gusen, which is around a concern about um, now having the, when you have departments that participate in the VULA program or you have the app, when people come in with paper, they seem not to then accept the paper and ask them to go back and be referred electronically. Is that something you've experienced? And is that something that you think um, can be mitigated? Because of course, if somebody has already been referred and found themselves at the referral hospital, um, it, they shouldn't have to go back to their original facility to get re-referred electronically. I don't know if this is an exception or um, a particular issue that um, she's experienced, uh, but I think it would be important to make sure that those kind of um, uh, boundaries exist where people are uh, can be referred in more than one modalities basic modality basically yeah sure i think that case um uh was in a dermatology case and it's very hard to to describe or to draw a picture ac accurately of a dermatological uh condition and that's why all the forms on vula are very specific they're not just general he has a history he has your examination it's very specific per specialty and it does require people to put in information so that an accurate referral is made uh, we all know that the specialist resources um, in South Africa are scarce and overburdened, and we need to make sure that we improve those systems. Uh, so when Vula is used, uh, there's a reduction, uh, an average reduction of 33% of cases that actually need to be referred. So you save the patient travel time, uh, the primary, primary um, health worker actually learns from that case and perhaps treats more clinicians like that in the future. And so there's huge improvements to the system once Vula is being used. Uh, so many departments are asking people to use Vula in preference to just sending a patient to a tertiary hospital with a piece of paper, which is, uh, can be awful for that patient, uh, especially if they don't get the care they need. Uh, the other nice thing is that if you do want to contact that uh, department straight away, you can do that on Vula. Like if you're, if you're a health worker, uh, you can contact that person straight away. So I think that it opens up that channel of communication that is, is impossible through just sending a patient to a hospital um, without the proper referral system done. Okay. Also happy if there's individual cases, yeah, please contact me and we can help sort them out. Great, thanks. I'm sure there are always uh, growing pains that also need to be ironed out. Um, there's a question on here for the PIMART, uh, for Siraj and PIMART presentation. I think maybe just clarify the difference between NIMART and PIMART because some uh, patients, of course, he's asking, if as a NIMART nurse, can she work as a PMART nurse as well? So I think it's just about clarifying what the distinctions are between those categories. Sure. Um, so I think the Directs Journal has approved that process for the NIMART nurses to work um, at a, a, a retail pharmacy to be able to um, offer the PMART services. Uh, Lauren, you want to just clarify that uh, Sandile did approve that? Yes, in December last year on World AIDS Day, uh, the DG approved nurses that are NIMAR trained working in private sector pharmacies being able to initiate treatments. Okay, that's great. So I hope that answers your question, uh, patients. Um, a question from uh, Desmond. Um, he's, I'm not sure exactly what he's asking about specifically because he's asking about intention of increasing the scope of the app over time and what's the process of adding a new disease to the app such as advanced HIV. And I don't know if he's talking about the electronic um, guidelines or the Vula app um, 
And I think that, you know, generally most from the presentations um, and uh, you can see that most of these are modular and already include uh, advanced HIV. Definitely the guidelines include those and the Vula app, of course, also does. But maybe William, we can ask, uh, add a little bit of detail on how you, you, you get new departments or new areas opened up in the Vula referral app. And that also speaks to the next question from Graham about um, the key decision makers for Vula implementation in new hospital or new province that would need to be engaged um, by those interested in seeing it implementing their services. So basically the two things, one is how do you start with a new department? Let's say you have dermatology and you want to add something new, if this is what um, uh, Desmond is asking about specifically on the Vula app. And then the second one would be around um, what, need, what needs to happen at the hospital level to be able to engage um, with Vula. And then maybe we can take a similar question for um, the uh, PIMAT program. Sure. Yeah. So in terms of adding a new portal or a new module, um, uh, we only build on requests. So all of those specialties using Vula, all 53 have come to us and said, please, can we use Vula? Uh, we then design the form or the module together with that department. And uh, once they um, are happy with that module, we're ready to go and then they can launch. In terms of um, uh, communication at the hospital level or in a department, the most important person to, uh, for us to meet with is the head of department. Uh, typically, uh, he or she just needs to give permission for Vula to be, to be used. I mean, currently you're using WhatsApp, so um, no one got permission for that, unfortunately. Um, but basically, once the HOD is given the approval, uh, we ask the HOD to nominate what we call a team lead in the department, uh, typically another consultant who is our sort of go-to person because the HODs are busy. And then we work with that person to onboard uh, the department and then inform the peripheral hospitals or clinics or health workers that they can now use Vula to refer to that department. Um, so if you're an HOD, then um, great to speak to you. Or if you know your HOD, then let's, yeah, please make an introduction. Okay, great. Um... I think the other question that's opened by Rakesh is about uh, certificates. Uh, for those that come, I think that's an admin question. Um, and I'll let the society maybe answer that either in written or format or, or talk to Rakesh separately. I don't see any other questions. Um, any further questions for the, for the panelists? Okay. So it looks like we've gone around. Um, thank you very much for those really informative sessions, uh, Will and uh, Siraj. I think these are great uh, programs. I think um, the Vula app is going to be is transformational, uh, having worked in on both sides of that coin in terms of trying to refer patients even intra-hospital intra sometimes. Um, and so I think that that's great. And I think the PIMOD program as well is really needed in South Africa. So I think that's it from my side in terms of moderating on the questions. We don't have any more further questions. I'll hand over uh, to Graham to um, finalize the meeting. Great, thanks Regina. I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, Jeremy to make a few comments uh, to wrap up this evening, but just from my side to say that it's, it's been a fantastic webinar. Thanks to all the speakers and to Regina for, for uh, uh, coordinating that Q&A session. Um, you know, I think that for me, the take home is that there have been incredible innovations in digital health uh, over the last few years um, and, you know, the society's contribution now with these guidelines. Um, and, it, you know, it can only lead to improved quality of care for patients and improved patient outcomes. So this is really great to see. Uh, and thanks to everyone for this evening. So over to you, Jeremy. Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Graham. Um, I, I just want to address one thing. So, Will, uh, people are asking, how can they get the app? They can download this on the app stores, right, via Android or, or Apple? Yeah, Android, Apple, Apple, Huawei, um, yep, the search place. And they just need to register, so only health workers are allowed to use it. Uh, so once they've downloaded it, um, they can start using it uh, once they've been approved. So, yeah, it's a safe environment for health workers. Great. Thank you very much. So. Um, again, just to echo what Graham said, I mean, thank you to all the presenters tonight. 
Um, you know, we've we've heard from uh, you know about about Willa and and uh, from Siraj also about the digital health platforms, but just again to to you know to bring back to the launch really of the digital version of our guidelines today. Thank you, in, created incredible hard work from the South African HIV, HIV Clinician Society, Southern African HIV Clinician Society, um, the digitization team. Um, really, we're looking, you know, specifically at Karen, Renata, Melissa, and Lauren um, in terms of the PDF version, and then of course uh, Jonathan and the entire ISIS team in terms of the web-based platform. And I, I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, we've had enormously positive feedback. Uh, I mean, I'm getting messages from my cell phone, getting messages on the Q&A and the chat, uh, sharing appreciation. So thank you very much uh, to everyone for the hard work. And we're very excited, really, to take this forward to the next step. Um, so again, just to reiterate, please do sign up for updates. Please do share with your friends. Uh, these links are now live on the uh, Southern African HIV Clinician Society website. You can access these guidelines. You can download the guidelines. You're welcome to share as much as possible. The broader, the further they go, the more, more of an impact they'll have. And please do give feedback. So we will uh, work with RISIS to make sure that we add a feedback button to that homepage. Please do, for the guidelines, please do give us your feedback because we are interested in seeing what unmet needs, uh, needs are, are out there. Um, and we are delighted that we're able to move it forward um, again. And thank you again for your time and to everyone at the, uh, the SAHIV Clinician Society for a wonderful webinar. And thanks very much. We'll see you guys soon. Thanks.